Ben McNamara will be first. He's the General Manager of Operations at CBH, and he's only been in the role for a little over 12 months. I've been impressed with Ben's efforts to listen to growers at a local level, um, and it's again evident with his presence here today, so thanks, Ben. Uh, ben is here to share the results of CBH's financial year and also the performance of the 1920 harvest sites. Thanks, Ben. Thanks very much. Um, thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak with you today as well. Um, just done a series of, uh, pretty, pretty much been on the road for three weeks uh, doing um, what we've called post-harvest review meetings, um, talking with bid reps from each of our sites. What's interesting with those is that um, no one likes to sit in the front row everywhere I go, so we basically just have one row. Um, Okay, today I'm going to talk about three sections. Uh, firstly, I'm just going to go through um, a little bit about our financial results um, and the performance uh, during FY19. Um, sorry, first I'm going to talk about uh, supply and demand. Second, I'm going to talk about the FY19 results. And then lastly, I'm just going to talk a little bit about network strategy and some of the work that we have done and what we're, uh, what we're doing going forward. Okay, just a quick um, executive summary. Um, so last year we received 16.4 million tonnes. Remember we're talking about the FY19 numbers and obviously in the harvest just gone we received 9.7. Um, this part of the world was probably one of the, one of the areas which uh, bucked the trend across the state. Um, secondly, and um, from an all injury frequency rate, we've certainly improved in that area. We've gone down from the, uh, from the high 13s down into the 9s. And pleasingly, uh, at the moment, we're about at, around about the eight mark. That still means that um, we're injuring someone every uh, seven odd days in CBH, and hence the reason why safety is our number one focus. Um, we also spent $285 million on the network. Um, that was spread across um, both capital and, uh, and an OPEX perspective, so about 235 on the CAPEX side and about 50 million on the maintenance perspective. Um, You'd all be familiar with the, with the fact that uh, our marketing and trading business faced uh, some strong headwinds. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, obviously an area looked after by, um, by Jason Craig. Um, and then finally, just around the returning value aspect, um, there was a dollar a tonne rebate from an operations perspective. Um, but, uh, but when you also add in the $4 uh, fee reduction, that brings us up to about the $76.8 million mark. So from a, um, from a supply and demand perspective, we look really around the production side to start with. Um, you can see across the 10-year average here, or 10-year um, uh, tonnes received, um, the average has been going up um, quite considerably. The 10-year uh, the average now sits at 13 million tonnes, and the five-year average is roughly at 4 million, 14 million tonnes. And obviously the year just gone uh, has broken that trend at 9.7. That's been largely driven by the change in the crop composition. Wheat is continuing to be a, a lower contributor and barley is making up the difference. I think that would be a fairly familiar trend to many of you, particularly given uh, some of the newer varieties that are coming out, um, particularly your Spartacuses and planets uh, in this part of the world. And you can see this year 34% of the crop um, was, uh, was in deep um, barley. Um, ben, ben, um the previous 10 year average, that's about the long and back line left the organisation for say that, that was 10.2. Yeah, it was 10. 10 point, you know, when we look at the network strategy, we're really looking back beyond this piece and we're working off about a 10.8 million tonne mark. And so you can see that the number has gone up quite dramatically, partly driven by hectares, sort of swapping out from, let's say, uh, livestock across to sheep. That's probably been pretty stable over the last uh, few years. It's more with uh, bigger yielding crops that are coming through, driven, as I said, probably more by the barley aspect. Um, demand from Asia, um, I think, again, a, a fairly con um, a story that's well understood. We've got an increasing urban population, um, which is going to be the majority of the population in, in where our contestable markets are. And a lot of the demand is also coming out of, uh, out of the feed consumption as opposed to food consumption. So um, as you can see, there's a far more aggressive growth rate there from a feed perspective. And that goes to that rising middle class, um, particularly in those Asian markets, 
um, which are seeking their, their protein coming from um, particularly meat. Um, so that's a, a good story, but also feeds back into the one that I was talking on the previous um, slide, particularly around the barley and some of the feed grains that are going there. I guess one of the um, one of the the, uh, the areas which offsets the positivity is really around the Black Sea, and um, what you can see there on the on the chart on the left hand side is all the grains that are growing. So that includes things like corn, wheat, uh, and barley, and uh, you can see that uh, those volumes are going up very considerably since 1990, and you can see that uh, we continue to expect um, that they will increase their production. Um, that's as they become increasingly westernised in some of their practices and you know, we've even got some Western Australian growers who are, uh, who are deploying their uh, capability in that part of the world. What that's meant is obviously downward pri um, pressure on price um, and you can see that if you, re if you index the, uh, the wheat price since 1990, you're looking at about half of what we received um, back in those days um, and hence the reason for some of our strategic drives. From a this is a, uh, a cost curve, and essentially what it, what it does is stacks up two components. One is the, uh, the paddock costs, um, so what it costs to, uh, to grow a tonne of wheat, um, and also um, the supply chain costs to get it from your paddock all the way through the market. And in this example, we've used Chilagon in, uh, in Indonesia. Um, what we've then done is said, well, what are the key markets that are producing grain? Um, we start with Russia, Krasnodar is a, is a large growing region in, uh, in Russia, uh, then broader Russia, Ukraine, um, Western Australia, South Australia, the East Coast, Canada and the US. Um, and what this is, the, the width of the bars is, is suggesting their production. Um, and what you can see here is whilst the top 25% of Western Australian growers are very competitive as compared against their, uh, their peers in, in the Black Sea, the average is sitting in the middle at $244 a tonne. And very much our strategy is about how do we take some of these supply chain costs, uh, how do we reduce those and push growers to the left-hand side of that cost curve to make sure that we're increasingly competitive against those other growing regions. I think the other piece that probably is historically well understood is, is quality probably has historically deteriorated as you move to the left-hand side and there is some discount. but. Uh, what we're tending to find now is, um, is the quality of that uh, black sea wheat is continuing to improve. Um, relatively busy slide, one uh, that Jimmy Wilson talks to, uh, to a lot. Essentially it's trying to bring all, all aspects of the CBH strategy onto, onto one page. Um, it is the supply chain, so the inputs component. WA growers very much forefront of our mind, storage and handling business and marketing and trading. Um, if I start on the left-hand side, really what this is, is uh, talking to is inputs, particularly the fertiliser business, is, uh, is an important aspect. What we're driving to do here is provide transparency in the market um, and provide growers with low-cost access to, to fertiliser. Um, it's a no-frills business. Uh, if I jump across the growers, as you know them, them quite well. Um, from a storage and handling business, really it's about... Um, um, maintaining that effective and efficient logistics network, making sure that we are keeping our costs and therefore charges as low as possible. Um, we do that by continuing to drive at our uh, network strategy. And that means we're pushing towards those 100 sites. And then from a marketing and trading perspective, really seeking out that 30 to 60% 60, 60 um, market share, um, depending on the circumstances in play in any given year. Um, and also, you know, providing that honest broker on, on price. If we just turn our mind to the FY19 performance, so I mentioned briefly in the introduction just around the safety performance, you can see the trend over time. Um, we've come all the way from 38 down to, to 9 in 2019. And as you can imagine, we're always going to seek to, uh, to improve our safety outcomes for our people. Um, we've done a lot of work on simplifying our safety systems uh, in the last uh, 12 to 18 months, um, making sure our syst safety systems are increasingly pragmatic and sensible for our front line to implement. Um, and that's obviously having a positive impact. We go beyond this number, as I said, we're continuing to see improvements in that space. We're always going to want to try and be, uh, improve our safety outcomes though. From a uh, financial perspective from, for operations, um, there's, uh, you can see that obviously the net profit um, after tax is about 100 million, 
it's this number here. Um, but if you remember that we provided the uh, $4 f um, fee um, reduction, $2 to growers, $2 to marketers, you add that back, you end up with, um, with a net profit after tax of about $160 million. Uh, the FY18 result was a little lower given um, the 13.4 million tonne harvest in that particular year. You remember, as I said earlier, we're particularly leveraged at, uh, to the fixed cost base of the, uh, of the supply chain. Um, from a fees and charges perspective, what that, um, by keeping uh, the efficiency in the, in the supply chain, what it allows us to do is, is to continue to um, drive that differential between our pricing and, uh, and our East Coast peers. Now, it's, it's uh, never easy to do a, a straight comparison. This is um, with, uh, with our East Coast peers, but this is the best we can do. And it basically supports the fact that we're on this side of the country paying about half of what, uh, what growers do on the East Coast. And this little dip here reflects the $4 um, fee reduction, as I mentioned earlier. Um, one of the areas which we've really um, done a lot of work on over the last probably two or three years is improving technology. Um, CDF app is a really good example of that. And what CDF app provides uh, not only to growers to make the, uh, the delivery process a little um, more straightforward, but also provides us with some fantastic information around turnaround times. Um, and historically, we haven't really captured uh, the queue time either. This information now does that. Um, really pleasingly, we've reduced our cycle times from 46 minutes all the way down to 37 minutes in the last few years. Um, the data is not perfect as we're, we're continuing to see more and more people use CDF app. So this year it was around 91% of deliveries used uh, the CDF app. So the data is getting more reliable as we move forward. That also in queue, includes the queue time as I mentioned earlier. It also allows us to unpack some of the, uh, the bottlenecks on our sites and then start to determine where we should be deploying our capital uh, to improve uh, cycle times and get back to your paddock as quick as possible. If we look across the zones um, in this part of, this, um, of the charts, the one that's, uh, that's particularly or a little higher is, um, is the Esperance uh, zone. Esperance uh, has, a, has an interesting one. 60% of the tonnes actually go to the port precinct. Um, you get um, weighed and sampled at, uh, at Chadwick, which is a site just out of town. And from in certain instances, you've got to actually deliver to the port, which is about a 15-minute commute. Um, and hence the reason why the cycle times are a little higher. But a 37-minute turnaround time, significant improvement, probably a little lower given, um, given the, uh, the lower tons in the network. Paddock planner, a um, little bit of discussion on this uh, last year. Um, as the charts show, we've uh, received a, a significant increase in the participation rate. This is a really important aspect for us to, uh, to plan out harvest. And uh, essentially the dots that you can see on the page there are, are, are reflecting each of the paddocks that have been completed. So in 2018-19 season, we had about 33% completed and the year just gone, we had 72%. Paddock plan is a really important piece for us for three key reasons. One is about um, planning for the harvest, so making sure we get the, the right segregations at the right sites. And um, if you zoom in, you you'd be able to start to see where we've got Spartacus growing, what are the sensible sites to take the, uh, the malt Spartacus service at. So that's the first one. The second one is really around tracking harvest and making sure we've got that efficiency of harvest. This is where we, um, where we can start to see what paddocks are actually active. That then drives the number of hours that we should be providing, um, but also around when we need to turn services off. So for example, if there's all canola's finished, we can redeploy the, uh, the resources working on a canola grid. And then thirdly, it's about how we plan the network out in the future um, and making sure that we grow the right sites and put the, I guess, the sufficient storage on each of those sites to be able to service the growers um, at those uh, locations. Um, moving on to marketing and trading. Um, obviously, there's been a, a fair amount of discussion about uh, marketing and trading um, with a net profit a net loss after tax of the, uh, the 119 million stated there. Um, this is uh, not one of my areas, so I'm not going to talk in too much detail, but clearly um, uh, the marketing and trading business um, 
was was not immune to uh, to what all traders uh, in the ag space felt during uh, FY19. Um, obviously, there was a number of challenges which have um, are documented up there around the anti-dumping um, investigation into Australian barley, um, the unexpected movements in wheat price, and I'll show you a quick chart on that. Um, and then, obviously, the East Coast um, drought has has played some um, some games with. Uh, with, uh, I guess, pricing for, for our marketing and trading business as well. Ben, the, the organisation, if I remember correctly, Grainfield gave CBH $80 million when we merged them as a reserve. And I can remember on the board of Grainfield, we lost $25 million. Yep. That $80 million was growers' money. And I believe CBH has actually got $300 million set aside that was part of the 80 and they've added to it. So the loss is actually money gone out of the bucket into growers' pockets. Yep. So it's not a true loss in as much as you have reserves in there. And I, I don't think that's explained enough. Yeah. In essence, essentially, uh, marketing and trading have overpaid growers for their grain. Notwithstanding that, $119 million is not the desired outcome. I think in terms of our equity position, just over $300 million. And obviously that, uh, that loss has now brought the equity position down to just over 200 million. So, um, you know, it's still a strong business, um, but obviously we don't want to be losing that volume of, uh, of cash out of the business. Just a comment on that, I had a chat to Jay the other day, and uh, 300 million was more than we needed in there, but it was there for unknowns, and uh, all those things, the Chinese and the uh, federal government, CBH was no orphan, that's for sure. Okay. Um, okay. It's just on that then, you know, that 2018, the, the grain growth of Western Australia, to get plant farm figures, made 12.3% uh, return on capital. The average for the six years prior to that is only 6%. So growers did really well out of the traders, including CBH, they've done very well out of the traders. They had a big year with high grain prices and a lot of confidence. For the grain, but the, the unknown said, which no one can plan, you had the drought on the east, you had the Chinese, you had the uh, Canadian wheat coming in, that caught all the traders out, so the CBH wasn't running. Ben, what's, what's disappointed me? If the negative has gone out of me. I was probably pretty, I had 21 years up there in amongst them and understood how it worked. But what's annoyed me, there's been nothing come out in the media to our 3,800 growers to say, well, this has happened. Yep. Um, we planned for this, you know. We're all human when you're trying to sell stuff. Yeah. I'm not sure about that, Wally. I'm not sure if you'd comment. 
I, th I think we have done a fair amount of communication on this. We, we spent a long time talking about it at the AGM a couple of weeks ago as well. So I, I think there's been a lot of dialogue. Maybe it's got lost in, uh, in some of the other noise that's been created. Um, I'm just conscious of the time, so I might push on if that's OK. Um, just in terms of uh, from a network investment perspective, um, invested 285 million as I um, suggested for, before. 50 million of that is in, uh, in importantly in the maintenance aspect. Um, we added last year about a million tonnes of storage um, and we did a hell of a lot of throughput enhancements as well. So storage is really reflecting the fact that the crop size is going up. Um, the throughput piece is trying to improve those turnaround times and that's how we're driving that 37 minutes down. Um, way bridges, we did a lot of way bridges last year. This is really around the integrity of way bridges but also around the, the throughput aspect as well. Um, so this slide just demonstrates some of the work that we did. Um, we touched a lot of sites last year um, down in this part of the world. Uh, you would have seen that we did uh, some significant work at Broom Hill, which I'll talk about you know, in a second. We also did a lot of work at Cranbrook um, and further across uh, um, at Gardner as well. There's more planned in the future. Um, so in terms of, uh, of Broom Hill, um, we added uh, essentially these two bulkheads on the end and we added a, a, um, a new way bridge down at the other end of the site as well just to improve with those, those cycle times and get growers out quicker. Um, we serviced that with drive over grids. Um, they were the new um, belt dogs that we had down here which have a, have a faster throughput. Um, there's still some work to do to enhance, uh, enhance those, um, those dogs. Um, Pleasingly, we reduced the cycle time, took more grain at the site. Um, but as you can start to see, we're really focused on those, those cycle times. As we move forward, we're going to continue to, uh, to, to uh, develop the, uh, the network. This year, we've got work planned out at, um, at Hyden. That's quite a large um, site expansion. Connor Goring um, up in uh, Area 5, Wotheroo, close by, and Mora. Those sites are all in in an area which has uh, seen some significant growth in tonnages um, as they've moved away from, uh, from sheep and cattle. Um, Dale site expansion um, is providing more segregation capability and, and Brookton really is, uh, is a very large site which has got um, utilisation well in excess of 150% of the storage. So what we're finding is we're, we're moving a lot of tonnes to the port during harvest. This allows us to, uh, to hold those, site, those tonnes at that particular site. In addition, um, we've got a number of throughput enhancement projects still being planned, speed up those tonnes through the sites. Um, and then critically, we've got a whole lot of work going on around accommodation. This is about um, accommodation was mostly built in the 60s and 70s. Um, we have a lot of work to do in that space. We want to make sure we, uh, we, one, we're respecting our people, but also encouraging people to come back. There's a strong correlation between um, returned uh, harvest casuals, particularly samplers, and, uh, and the performance of our sites during harvest. Um, there's also a lot of work to do from a, uh, from a height safety, or broadly from a safety perspective, and we're doing a lot of work in that space as we move forward as well. Um, just in conclusion, so um, one of the things that, uh, that Wally was alluding to from an M&T perspective is uh, implementing a new risk limits to reduce some of that financial exposure from an M&T perspective. Um, we're also going to continue to focus on cost control as we move forward, particularly when you've got a, a smaller harvest um, of the 9.7 million tonnes as we've got in the system at the moment. The, uh, the coronavirus um, and the Chinese anti-dumping um, pieces will still continue to play out. There is significant uncertainty around those pieces at the moment and lots of work is going on into that at, at this current point in time. Uh, MRL limits um, have been a really interesting uh, area for us as well, um, and, a, and an area that we've uh, done a lot of work in over the last 12 or so months. Um, but also it's one that uh, we continue to work with um, different regulatory bodies to make sure we're getting that alignment. Um, the IMI one is, uh, is a good example of that as well. Marketing and trading continuing to, uh, to develop new markets and customers. They're doing this in, uh, in a variety of ways. And then finally, continue to invest in the network um, to, uh, to realise on our strategy of those 100 sites with, uh, with appropriate cycle time. With that, 
I might uh, ask for any questions. I would like to see if I can, sorry. <laughs> That's a chunky question, right? So um, I think, you know, we talked around the M&T one, right? So you've got to be careful around what prices you pay. You can't overpay um, because, like you say, you've got to be able to sell it into export markets and be in a competitive position. Um, I guess so that's one of the areas, and clearly it's a key area of focus, and that's why I showed you the cost curve, right? That's why the cost curve becomes such an important aspect for us to understand. Um, it also goes to the reason why CBH is seeking to continue to be uh, increasingly efficient, right? Um, so we can continue to keep our storage and handling charges as low as possible. So that's another area that we're focused on. You would have heard us talk around the transformation exercise. That's why we're focused on that. And the third area that you talked around was inputs. Um, well, that's why we're also in fertiliser, because we realise that your paddock costs need to also come down. And one of the key areas that we can play in is obviously fertiliser, given it's a, a bulk commodity. Um, and that's, that's why we're working there as well, to focus on providing you pricing transparency and get those, uh, those costs as low as possible for you. So, um, you know, inputs, part of our strategy. Um, storage and handling efficiencies, part of our strategy. And marketing and trading, making sure that it's paying appropriate prices, part of the strategy and the board's very much part of that. Unfortunately, there's no, there's no silver bullet. If you follow Chicago wheat price, as I have for 35 years, it's averaged $5 US a bushel. I didn't hear it this morning, probably $5.32 or something. It's been the same price for 35 years. Yep. Yep. With inputs going. <laughs> um, last year, you dropped the oat, the growth standard for um, oat delivery. Yep. And um, we've always struggled with the new oak varieties being lighter in weight. We have to thrash them harder with a header increasing the growths. Mm -hmm. So we've always driven that balance. Yep. How did that go this year and will it stay next year? I think it was probably a challenging season um, from a finishing perspective. Um, I think if you, I guess the key drive is coming from the, uh, the millers really um, about getting the quality aspects there. Obviously, this year had some challenges from a season. I think it will be here to stay. I'm not sure there's probably others that are more educated than some. Trevor, you're, you're across this as well. Well, it's not a, it's not a, they're not CBH um, standards. They're GWAR standards. Um, well, I hope CBH sits on GWAR. Or the industry body that sets the standards, not CBH. We, we can't be involved in setting standards and being the major storage and handling provider at the same time. That, that's the point. So, so we're basically just a member of GWA, same as uh, the Oak Council is. So uh, that's where the responsibility lies. Other questions? If not, I'll hand back. Thanks very much for your time.